Well, good morning, everybody. Let's try that again. How are you today? Good, good. Well, I am really pleased and honored to be here. I, it's a treat for me. I rarely get a chance to come to the South. I'm from California. And I don't think I've been in North Carolina since I hitchhiked through here when I was 17. And I won't tell you what year that was. Um, no, it really is a, a privilege uh, for me to be here with you, um, particularly in a conference like this, and I've been talking to some of the organizers. I really want to thank Rafi for this invitation. Um, the concerns which all of you are addressing in, in this conference um, are precisely the concerns I think we have to address in the United States and actually around the world. Um, I want to give a shout out first here to Food First, I don't know why we haven't worked with Rafi more in the past. We've been around for 43 years. And um, we actually work on the same things uh, in a little bit of a different way. But we were started 43 years ago by a woman named Frances Moore LePay. Have any of you heard of Frances Moore LePay? A couple of you. She wrote a book called Diet for a Small Planet. And it became a bestseller. And with the uh, royalties from that, she started Food First, and we're, we call ourselves a, a people's think tank, or a think and do tank. And um, yeah, our mission is to end the injustices that cause hunger, because in Francis Morlepe's book, um, she discovered something which was revolutionary at the time. There were, at that time, I'm talking about the late 70s, mid-70s, about one in seven people in the world were going hungry. That was about uh, 650 million, something like that. People were going hungry around the world. Uh, and the book, The Population Bomb, by Paul Ehrlich had just come out. And um, Frankie was doing, she was a graduate student, she was doing her research because everybody was saying, oh, we've got to double the production of food um, over the next generation because basically the world is becoming overpopulated and we don't know how to feed all these people. Look, one in seven people are already going hungry. And she found that in fact the, word was, the world was producing one and a half times more than enough food for everybody. We were overproducing food and yet one in seven were going hungry. So when she looked into it, she realized that people were going hungry not because there wasn't enough food, but because it, they couldn't afford the food which was being produced. And then as she looked into it deeper, she asked, well, why can't they afford the food that's being produced? And if there's so much food, why isn't it getting to them? And that's where she came to the conclusion that the cause of hunger is not scarcity, the cause of hunger is injustice. And so I want to talk about that today. I have uh, a lot to cover, and I'm going to work up ahead of steam and probably take my jacket off. I mean no disrespect. Um, but I just want to say, this is my farewell tour. I'm retiring from Food First after 13 years. Um, I'll be speaking here in Maine, in um, Vermont, and in New York before I go home. But this is my last tour. And um, I thought about this a lot on the plate and right out. You know, what, I know I'm going to say, I always say the same thing. So I, I know what I, I'm going to say, I'm going to share the lessons of 13 years at Food First, doing the research on hunger and accompanying social movements and whatnot. Um, but there's more to that. Because, you know, you become a part of this work. It defines who you are. I've been at this for 40 years now. Um, and you don't ever really walk away from it. So even though I'm retiring from Food First, I'm still going to be continuing the work. I just don't have to run an organization to raise all that money anymore. Um, and I guess I just wanted to thank you again uh, for being able to share this moment. Uh, and even though I I know some of you personally. I don't know the rest of you. But I know what you're about. 
And I know we share the same deep beliefs. So thank you. So I was asked to talk about farm justice, and we'll talk about what that is. Parity, alliances, and So I grew up on farms in Northern California, grew up on dairy farms, and I worked on farms all the way through college, and I swore I'd never go back to a farm. And then I ended up working on, with farmers pretty much for the rest of my life. You learn a lot on farms, and you learn a lot from farming people. I think my first lesson was I, I worked on a dairy. We didn't have any land, even though my grandparents had been farmers. But by the time we came to this country, um, you know, we'd lost everything. That's why we came to this country. Um, so I ended up, we ended up on this dairy farm, just renting a house there. And uh, I, know, I was around 10. And uh, the farmer's son was my age, too. We were friends. And, and he taught me everything. Taught me how to drive the tractor and feed the cows and do the milking. And I just loved it, you know. Um, it wasn't work to me. It wasn't exactly play. But it gave my life so much meaning as a 10-year-old boy. I, I really felt like a person. I felt important. And my favorite job was cleaning out that waiting pen where the cows wait before they go into the milk barn. You know, the one that gets six inch deep in manure. I loved scooping that out and then taking the power hose and washing it down till it was spick and span. I just felt like this tremendous sense of accomplishment. I love that job. I love the smell of manure. And you know, I had my milk boots, the knee-high rubber boots, and I was so proud of those things because they showed I was a worker. Mm -hmm. I had worth. I had value. I knew what I was doing. I get stuff done. But I always wondered, you know, where did that all, all that manure, where did it go? Because it just kind of went off into this kind of gully. You know, I thought about it. It's like, you know, how many years has this farm been here? How, how much manure is that? Because I've knew it was a lot of manure when I cleaned it out every day. So I asked the farmer. And he said, oh, it just goes over there. He said, and don't you even think about going over there and taking a look. You stay out of that. <laughs> you just tell a kid that. So sure enough, you know, the next day I took my BB gun and my dog and, and we went around the, the side of the gully and we came up from behind and got closer and closer, you know, about a quarter of a mile I had to walk around to get there, and saw this huge forest of like wild carrot and lush green weeds, you know, head high weeds, and that was it. That was the mountain of manure. That was the manure pile. And I looked down and, and you know, it was like dry tiles, white tiles. You could walk on it. It was nice and firm. And so my dog and I started walking up the manure pile, and, you know, just get closer and closer, and um, I was just about near the top, you know, I thought I could just see the barn, and sure enough, whoop, I sunk up to my waist. Uh-oh. And so I tried to move one way, and one boot came off. I tried to move the other way, and the next boot came off, and I kind of scared. You know, those movies where the cowboy sinks in the quicksand and I didn't have a horse to pull me out or anything. But it was a very important moment in my life because for the first time I realized I was in deep <laughs> manure. So I thought that was a fitting story for my talk because, brothers and sisters, we are in deep manure. Luckily, with our food system, but luckily, we have a very vibrant food movement that's been growing in this country for a number of years. We've got organic agriculture, we have urban farms, we have CSAs and farmers markets and farm to school programs. I mean, we basically have, if you look at the food value chain from farm to fork, all along that value chain, people in this country are trying to make things better. People in this country are trying to address 
food access, are trying to address poor nutrition, are trying to address the degradation of the environment and of our soils on our farms. People are doing stuff, and they're coming up with answers. They're figuring out what to do in the face of some very serious problems. And I think we really need to celebrate that. I'm sure many of you are doing this work, if not all of you, are doing some sort of work like this, whether it's in your community, in your church, in your schools, in your local governments. And I just want to thank you. I want to applaud you because you are the cutting edge. You're like the pilot project before the big project kicks in. However, before we pat ourselves on the back too much, let's take a look at the, at the statistics. You remember how I said one in seven people in the world were going hungry 40 years ago? Today, one in seven people in the world are going hungry. And one in seven people in the world, I mean, one in seven people in the United States are going hungry. We don't call it hunger, we call it food insecurity. The USDA won't let you use the word hunger. Don't ever apply for a grant to the USDA and say hunger. You won't get the money. But in fact, hunger tracks very closely with poverty and it tracks very closely with agriculture. And it tracks very closely with people of color. Because if we look at where the highest indices of food insecurity are in the United States, it's with black and Latino populations, immigrant populations. And it's in the countryside. And worse, it's in the food system. Most of the hungry people in our country work in the food system. They're either farm workers or farmers, or they work in the processing plants, or they work in the fancy restaurants in the back of the house. We did a study with restaurant workers in New York City and in San Francisco, and we found that the highest indices of food insecurity were at the fanciest restaurants. That's where the injustice part comes in. Now, if you look around the world, this number of, hunger, of uh, over a billion hungry people in the world is, is disputed. I think this is way too low. And if you look at the uh, Food and Agriculture Organization's figures for 1918, they say we're 921 uh, million or something like that. I don't believe that for a minute. They don't measure right. If you look at the measurements, you see they're way too low. Anyway, but let's just say there's a billion hungry people in the world. That's one in seven. I think a lot of you have heard all the concern about hunger in Africa. Now we have to solve the problem of hunger in Africa because Africa is so poor and the soils are so bad and the people are so uneducated that we've got to go over there and solve their hunger. And you have Bill Gates, you know, with, with his project and before that you had, well, there's been a long string of ex-presidents and philanthropists who were going to bring the Green Revolution to Africa. They were going to bring the fertilizers, the pesticides, the new seeds, the irrigation, the this, the that, the tractors, the big money to Africa, and they were going to solve hunger in Africa. But I always wondered, what? Yeah, I mean, well, first I always wondered, why are people in Africa so poor if Africa is such a rich continent? <laughs> but again, hunger and wealth sort of track in that way. I also wondered, if all of the hunger is mostly in Asia and the Pacific, why aren't we talking about Asia and the Pacific? Why are we always talking about Africa? And I can tell you why because Asia and the Pacific already had a green revolution. And they still have hunger. And that market is saturated. You're not going to be able to break into the pesticide market or the seed market or the machinery market in Asia. So we're not interested in solving their hunger because we can't sell anything. Oh, but in Africa, you can still sell stuff. So we're going to talk about the hunger in Africa as if it was a technical problem 
and not a problem of exploitation and resource extraction, distribution. But nonetheless, you hear over and over and over again, and I've been hearing this since I was a kid, that basically we've got a double food production or increase it by 70% over the next generation. And now we're saying that by 2050, when the world's population tops off between 10 and 12 million, 10 and 12 billion, that we're gonna need to increase the food production by 70%, and that's gotta come from the new technologies. The problem with that thinking is that we don't have a problem of food scarcity. If you look at the green line here, that's food production. So every year, we produce 12% more food per capita for everybody. Doesn't matter that more people are being born because this is a per capita calculation. That means every one of us and every new person who is born every year should be getting 12% more food because that's the increase in food production. And yet we still, one in seven people are still going hungry today just as they were almost a half a century ago. And the answer is very clear here. If you look at the, um, if you look at the, the orange dots, that's the level of undernourishment. In other words, that's hunger. Hunger does not change, even though you produce more food. And the reason is, if you look at the blue diamonds, because poverty doesn't change. That's the level of poverty. It's not going down. People are too poor to be able to find, to afford the food. Now, who are these poor people who can't afford the food? Who are they really? They're farmers and they're women. Women farmers produce over 50% of the world's food today. And yet women and girls make up 70% of the world's hungry. So after they get through feeding everybody else, then they go hungry. And these are farmers in Africa, in Asia, and in this country who have a postage, size, postage stamp sized piece of land. Eighth of an acre, quarter of an acre, maybe a half an acre. And they produce all this food on it, they take it to market right away, they gotta sell it because they're poor and they need the money. But if you take your, mar your food to market when everybody else is taking their food to market, that's when the price is low. So they sell low, and they sell most of their food because they need money, because they're poor, because they don't have enough land, because they don't have access to water. And then three, four, five, six months later, they run out of food. And then they have to buy food. But then the price of food has gone up. And that's when they go hungry. Now, we know that food is not, I mean, we know that hunger is not the result of scarcity. It's clear. No matter what they keep telling us, it's clear. No matter what the USDA says, no matter what the World Bank says, no matter what Monsanto, Syngenta, Smithfield, Tyson, any of those people say, we don't need to be producing more food in order to solve the problem of hunger. And if you look at this, this is the World Price Food Index. Let's see if I can get this thing right. Oops. I was sure I knew how to make this work. Oh, it doesn't matter. So this is the World Price, the, the World Food Index. It's the price of, the, of, of food around the world, and it starts way back like in 1910. And if what you look at this is the price of food has been going down. So it's volatile, it, it spikes and it drops, you know, and um, basically after World War I, the food, price of food goes down, and then you have this really sort of stable period um, from the 30s, basically from the New Deal to the 1950s, you have a, fair, a, a relatively stable price on food. And this is very important for farmers, right? But then the, the price really drops after the introduction of the Green Revolution in the 1960s. So what does this mean when the price of food drops? 
It means there's a lot more of it. It means, that the, and if, it means there's too much of it. It means we are saturating the markets. It means that farmers are not getting a fair price for their product. And it drops down until 2008, and suddenly we see a spike beyond anything we have ever seen before. I don't know if you remember the food price spikes of 2008 and 2011. They were unprecedented. In 2008, we had record harvests, but we had record hunger. That's where we broke the one billion mark of hunger. But you see, there were also record profits at the same time. There were record profits with ADM. The profits were up 20%. Monsanto's profits were up 45%. Cargills were up 85%. You know, the Cargill has a, a fertilizer arm. Mosaic, it's called. And they just went crazy. Everybody was buying fertilizer. And General Foods, which would be a, an example of the grocery industry in general, their profits went way up, over 60%. So these monopolies controlling our food system are making record, record profits when a billion people are going hungry. They made so much money, they didn't know where to put it. They had what we call a crisis of accumulation, which means you got so much money in the bank and you don't have enough places to invest it because people are too poor to be buying products. They started buying up land, shot the price of land up. That's another story, we'll get to that. So this is the food price index. And don't worry about the blue and the, and the red, it's basically the same thing. Um, and you can see that it goes up in 2008, it drops down again, and it goes up again in 2011. And you see those, those red lines, those vertical red dotted lines? That is the frequency of food riots. So what you can see is that when the food price index gets over a certain threshold, people riot. And in 2008, you had riots all over the place, places you would expect, like Haiti, where people were subsiding on mud biscuits. But you had riots in Italy, and you had riots in Minneapolis, because people could not access the food that was there. There was food in Haiti. They couldn't access the food that was there. Now, you see the second set of lines in 2011, tight set of riots there. That's the Arab Spring. That's what we're looking at. Basically means if you gouge too much, people will revolt, and if the government is at all vulnerable, it'll fall. So it's sort of a two-edged sword for industry, because you want governments to stay in place, because when they fall, it's bad for business but you do want those prices up. Here we go again. So on the left-hand side, there's that red line. You recognize it now, that's the food price index. Up it goes, 2008, goes down, goes up again, 2011. Then there's the blue line. That's the retail price. So the retail price goes up. It would if, if food is getting more expensive on the global market then the food in the store has to be more expensive too. So it goes up, but when the food in the global market, the price in the global market goes down, the blue line stays flat. That's called gouging. And that's where Walmart made billions of dollars. Walmart, Tesco, Carrefour, Safeway, all these monopolies made billions and billions of dollars. As I say, so much they didn't know what to do with it. And you can tell the, the conundrum they have because in this next graph, the blue graph, there it is again, goes up, comes down, starts to go up again. You know what that is? That is the value of Monsanto's stock. So the value of a company's stock goes up as people go hungry 
and goes down as people are fed. Now, what kind of a system is this? This is not a system based on need. This is a system based on demand. Demand is your ability to pay for things in the market, not whether or not your stomach needs it. That's why the United States will not sign the Declaration on the Right to Food. All the countries in the world, the United States will not sign the UN Declaration on the Right to Food because they believe that the market will feed everybody. Well, the market is about making money. It's not about feeding anybody. Anyway, the cause of the 2008 and 2011 food crises uh, was battered around a lot. Well, climate change, drought, rising meat consumption around the world. I mean, all of these things are true. They all contributed to bumping up the price of food. But then what really happened was the rise of the commodity index funds. Basically, financiers began to speculate with our food, pump that price up farther and farther and farther, and then pull out and let the price drop. So our food has become part of a system of international financial roulette. So those are the proximate causes of these food crises, but I think the root cause is, is that we have a very vulnerable food system. And it's vulnerable, vulnerable in, in both economic and um, environmental ways. When 90, over 90 percent of cropland is dedicated to just five crops with just a handful of varieties, you're setting up a situation like the Irish potato famine. Now, the longer is this system of monocropping and industrial agriculture spreads around the world, the more vulnerable we become. And it's a tremendously concentrated system. The power, the market power and the political power of this system is held by just a handful of monopolies. We had conversations last night about livestock, particularly about poultry, and the same would be true for dairy. You just try producing eggs or, or uh, broilers or milk or even growing soy. Just try and sell that. Just try and sell that stuff. Where are you going to sell it? You're not going to run down to the corner store and sell it. You've got to sell it to one of these monopolies. And they've got you. You've got to accept their price. You have to accept their conditions. And once you're in, it's hard to get out without losing your shirt. But we're talking about the economics of it. We should also talk about the environmental aspects. There are tremendous externalities to this dominant industrial system which has spread around the world since World War II. Tremendous amount of soil loss. Our, we're losing our aquifers. We've lost most of our agrobiodiversity, the plants, the seeds, the different cultivars. Agriculture is the largest emitter of greenhouse gases after the energy sector. Now, the consequences of that are climate change and severe weather events. This red line is the compilation of the increase in severe weather events. So ironically, on one hand, agriculture is one of the biggest contributors to global warming and severe weather events, and it's also one of the biggest victims. Now, why would a farmer do this? The answer is they wouldn't. The only people who want to perpetuate this system are the ones making the big money off it, and it's not the farmer. If you look at the United States, you can see that. Up on the left there, that's the number of dairy farms. The dairy farm I worked on as a kid is gone. Now they raise Appaloosa horses there. Not the farmer I worked for. Um, so we lose in our dairy farms. Look here on the bottom right, that's the value of land. 
Land is concentrating in fewer and fewer hands, and its value is going up, and it's being traded on international markets. Now, why is the value going up? Because people didn't know where else, because corporations didn't know where else to put their money. They made so much money, they don't know where to put it. So put it in land. Buy land, they're not making any more of it. So they put it in land. And this land is being traded on financial markets as we speak. Every second, hundreds of thousands of transactions of little tiny pieces of value from land and mortgages is being traded. You know, you got a mortgage, your bank sells that mortgage. And it gets packaged with a bunch of other mortgages, and that gets sold again. And that gets chopped up and repackaged and sold again, and chopped up and repackaged and sold again. So little bits of your land as a farmer is being traded around the world as we speak. What do you think the time horizon is for one of those traders? It's minutes. What's the time horizon for a good farmer? It's generations. So our financial system and our agricultural system are completely out of whack. Now, the impact of this on the United States is, I know you're going to try to read all this, but essentially is the gentrification of agriculture. So what's happening? We're losing all our middle farmers, middle-sized family farmers. And there's a tremendous increase in the number of very, very big farmers who are buying up this land. So land is concentrating. They're the ones who can afford it. And there's a tremendous increase of very, very small farmers. And so it's like the peasantization of American agriculture. And this is where we see a lot of women operators. We see a lot of um, new immigrant operators. We see a lot of young people, because this is as much as they can afford to get into, because land now is a barrier to entry. But most of these operations are not viable. People do it for the love of it, not because they're making any money out of it. They do it because it's the right thing to do. So what I'm talking about here is what we call the corporate food regime. I mean, so many of these things, why, why doesn't this change? The work that you're doing has been going on for a long time. People have been fighting against this system for a long time. Why doesn't it change? If you look at this in terms of a food regime, think of a food regime as all the institutions and all the rules that determine our food system. So an institution would be, for example, the USDA, and the rules would be the Farm Bill, for example, or the World Bank, or Bill Gates. <laughs> He's an institution. He gets to determine what happens in agriculture in Africa. So the first one was the colonial food regime, and we know about that, all right? That's where in this country, 12 million enslaved African farmers were brought in to create the wealth for Western expansion. And in Western expansion, we know about that too. That was a process of genocide and dispossession. Other countries were doing that around the world. The US did it on this continent. That's where the wealth of this country and how the wealth of this country was built. Then we get into the Keynesian food regime. I won't explain much about that, but basically that's you know, from the New Deal on. Um, and actually it was a very stable time for agriculture, but it wasn't necessarily that great for farm workers. It was not that great for African American farmers, for minority farmers, always on the edge. And when the farm crises began to hit, the first ones to go down were African American farmers. I remember, I remember back in the late 70s and the 80s, all of a sudden, all the white farmers were like, oh my God, we're losing our land. Yeah, well, you should have been paying attention because African American farmers who had built up over 10 million acres of land on the basis of hard work and cooperation without any help from the government after the Civil War began to lose their farms. 
They were the first ones to go down. They got no help. And then came all the white farmers. Then we had the big farm crisis in the 80s where we lost half of our farmers. It was African-American farmers who were the first ones to go. And if the National Farmers Union had allied themselves with the African-American farmers at that time, I might not be speaking here today. The corporate food regime which we are in today, basically started in the 80s with Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, who dismantled what was left of all the New Deal programs, which I'll get into later, privatized everything around the world, um, basically got countries around the world to remove, and here too, to do away with their grain reserves, let the market take care of it. Like, don't save for a rainy day. Don't use a grain reserve because a grain reserve will mediate the fluctuations in the market, because if the, if the price is too high on food, well, you let some more grain out of the reserve and it brings the price down. If the price is too low, you buy up some of the grain and it'll bring the price up. It's good for farmers. Get a nice, stable price, that's what farmers like. And consumers actually like that too. Well, they did away with those. They did away with all the marketing boards, all the supply management, so all of a sudden we have all this overproduction, the price is dropping, fluctuating wildly. Who wants that? I'll tell you who wants that. Big monopolies. They like volatility. They can make a lot of money on volatility. It's very bad for everybody else. And then you get the free trade agreements. And this is basically because we're overproducing food and we need to put our food somewhere else. So we have a little trick we use. We've been doing it since the 40s. Buy up the food from the farmers. Then we go and give it away. Give it away, you know, to one of those poor African countries that can't feed themselves. Here's some free food, you poor people, just to show you how much we care. So those governments then take that free food. It's called PL 480. And they sell it in local currency. And that's how you get money to run the government. What does it do to the local farmers? puts them right out of business. And it makes people dependent on imports. And if you go to the original language of our food programs from the USDA, PL 480, go on the website and take a look, it says very clearly, this is about opening up markets. It's not about feeding anybody. It's about crashing into their markets, destroying their systems of agriculture and making them dependent on food from the United States. All of these rules from the structural adjustment programs, the privatization of all the state programs, was happening here today. First, we imposed on the rest of the world through the World Bank and the IMF. And then because people said, hey, wait a minute, we don't want these rules. And they started voting out the presidents who had signed these treaties. I mean, who signed these agreements, rather, with, with the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. So we don't want these. You're breaking all our markets, putting us all out of work. Everything's become more expensive for us. They vote the bums out. Ah, that's when you get the World Trade Organization who comes in and takes all of these measures and cements them into international treaties. Those are the free trade agreements. You can't vote those out. They're in. In other words, they protected the market from democracy. They protected the market from the people. They protected the interests of the monopolies from the people themselves. Well, the results of the, has been disastrous. And I, I want to be very clear that, yes, we are in a crisis. This is a calamity. But this has been happening for a long time for many people. This is an old crisis for many communities, indigenous communities, immigrant communities, African-American communities. This is nothing new. It's just getting worse. The Global South used to export a billion dollars of food every year. Now they import 11 billion dollars. They are dependent on the North for their food. Industrial agriculture creates something like 20 to 40 percent of the world's greenhouse gases, uses up 80 percent of the fresh water, drinking water. 80 percent goes to industrial agriculture. 
Farmers go out of business. With the signing of the North American Free Trade Agreements, a million Mexican farmers went out of business. That's why we have an immigration problem in this country, because we destroyed those livelihoods with the free trade agreements. Don't tell me you're going to fix it with cages on the border. The, I won't read through the rest. Sort of the unsung casualty in this period, these last 30 years, and the privatization of everything the law, is the loss of our public sphere. That's what we have here today. We're discussing things. We're deciding on things. We're debating, thinking, listening. That's our public sphere. We've lost that in the United States to a tremendous degree. Now it's the market that decides on everything. And we've lost most of our public goods. When I went through college, the only way I went through was on scholarships. I went all the way through on scholarships. I had a whacking debt at the end of my college education of $2,000, which I owed my mom, my dad, and my uncle. And it took me five years to pay it off. So kids going to school now have $40,000 in debt for a liberal arts degree. Why is that? That's because we have privatized our public education. It is no longer a public good. It's a private good. We've lost the public sphere. And when I talk to students sometimes, I teach. When I talk to students, you know, they're amazed by these stories. <laughs> they don't even know what the public sphere is. I say public sphere, I have to explain it out loud. They don't know what it is. They've never seen one. And I think it's going to be very difficult to change all this unless we rebuild our public sphere so the power of the people can actually express itself. So people are upset. In this country, we talk about fixing a broken food system, vote with your fork, there's all kinds of initiatives. I want to take issue with this. I don't think the food system is broken at all. Look at the history. You want to fix it? Fix it to what? Fix it, fix it to, you know, the 1800s? What kind of food system was that based on slavery? Fix it to, I don't know, 1950s? When the Mexicans pick, up, pick all our crops in the United States, in, in California, and Southwest? Exploited Mexican labor. Had it not been for Mexican labor, the United States could not have fought the Second World War. Do you think we even thank them? What kind of a system is that? Can't fix this system. Fix it to what? Fix it makes you think it was working well. Not sure who it was working well for, but it wasn't us. So, been talking about the corporate food regime. Here's a secret. It's a capitalist food regime. It's not socialist, not communist, it's not anarchist. Let's just say it. It's a capitalist food regime. So that means it's going to act the way capitalism acts. And that's very important. It's not going to act any other way. It's going to act along the rules of capitalism. So anyway, basically, I, I, we talked about what a food regime is. And this present food regime, based on fossil fuels and global monopolies and um, sort of the meatification of our diets, and it's run by the monopolies, the World Bank, the World Food Program, and Big Philanthropy, USAID. I mean, these are the institutions. But if it acts the way a, a capitalist food regime acts, we know some things about capitalism. We've been studying it for 300 years. So capitalism always goes through two phases. It goes, goes through a phase of liberalization and a phase of reform, punctuated by a crisis. Now, what do I mean by that? Liberalization, I don't mean in favor of gay marriage. I mean the liberalization of the economy. It means you take the gloves off the market. You deregulate everything. You privatize everything. That's called a period of liberalization. 
and you have tremendous concentration of wealth during a period of liberalization. But because of that concentration of wealth, and because of the destruction that liberalization visits upon the environment and upon communities, throwing people out of work, driving people to bankruptcy, polluting waters, polluting the air, destroying soil. This happened many times in capitalist history, not just now. Pretty soon, people rise up, say we can't take it anymore, and they organize, and they push back, and they develop alternatives, and they introduce different policies, and they push for them. And then you come, that's called the counter-movement. Then you come into a period of reform. And with the reform, you basically, you control over supply, you, you, you institute regulations so you don't destroy the environment or destroy people's livelihoods. You pay people better wages, you give them more benefits. So an example of this was the Great Depression. Now prior to the Great Depression, we had the Roaring Twenties. Now in the Roaring Twenties, there was a period of liberalization. The market did whatever it wanted. And sure enough, the market crashed in 1929. That's the other thing that happens. You get a crash. You get liberalization. People start rising up and you get a big crash. And then Roosevelt was able to introduce reforms. You know, he started with agriculture. He introduced the New Deal. And so he introduces conservation programs because we had an environmental crisis called the Dust Bowl. He introduces work programs because everybody's out of work. He was using the government money, using taxpayer money to do this. He controls over production by introducing supply management. And he pays farmers a fair wage. Parity. Now, this was true for most farmers. This was not true for sharecroppers. This was not true. I don't have to tell you. I do have to go through this whole long thing in, <laughs> when I talk in California, when I talk in the North. That didn't come until later, and poorly. The point is that reforms were introduced because there was a strong counter-movement. It looked like this country was going to fall. It looked like capitalism was going to fall. Socialism looked pretty good to a lot of people. Political parties were strong, unions were strong, people had taken to the streets. There was pressure, sufficient social pressure, to create the political will which allowed the New Dealers to introduce these reforms. It was a strong counter-movement. And Roosevelt said it clear. He sat down with the, with the millionaires of the day and he said, look boys, you want to lose the whole pie or you want a smaller piece of the pie? Because this is going down. It was that critical. And then he told people, that's a great idea, now go out there and make me do it. Now it wasn't just being lazy there. He was recognizing the power of social movements. And the New Deal was incredibly successful. So if you look here, during the Roaring Twenties, you see the red line, this is um, GDP growth, gross domestic product. So you've got a steep red line, roaring 20s, you've got the flappers, and you've got prohibition, and everybody's having a grand old time. Um, and then you get the crash, the market crash, and then you get the New Deal. And then what you see with the New Deal is you get stronger economic growth during the New Deal than you did during the roaring 20s which simply means that controlling your market and distributing the resources more equitably is a better deal for the country. So today, we've got the Green New Deal We've been introduced. And I don't know if you've seen the um, resolution. It's not legislated. It's a resolution. It's very broad, and it doesn't really say much about agriculture. But it's trying to resurrect the New Deal is trying to resurrect the notion that somebody's got to do something about this. Because industry is not going to fix this. Industry is making too much money. They're not going to fix anything. They're incapable of doing it. 
Um, and so who's going to do it? Well, it's got to be the government. So what the New Deal is missing, in my mind, is what is at the core of the problems in the countryside? And that is a lack of parity. Farmers don't get a fair price. So they try to produce more in order to make up for the very poor price that they get for their products. But everybody's producing more. And when everybody is producing more and there are no price controls, then you get overproduction. And the price goes down even further. And then farmers try to farm their way out of debt by producing even more or getting into onerous contracts hmm? with Smithfield or Tyson or whoever it is. So the first thing we need to ensure is parity pricing for farmers. But we need production controls. We need supply management. So for example, yeah, we'll give you a fair price for your food that you produce, but you can't produce more than what your land can really bear. What I environmentally, your water table and your soil, your forests can actually bear. We're not going to allow you to sell more than that. This is not a new concept. This is an old concept. It works very well. We've abandoned it. But a Green New Deal, if it's going to be effective in addressing the devastation in the countryside of the United States, will have to resurrect the original New Deal's structural reforms on parity and on supply management. We're going to have to dismantle all these CAFOs. We have to buy them out. They're unsustainable. Dividing our communities, destroying our environments, and they're not giving farmers a good livelihood. If we really want to put carbon in the ground, there's no better way than photosynthesis. There's no better way than integrated multi-cropping, rotational, grazing. We're already overproducing food. Don't let them fool you. Don't let you think it's desperate. We ought to keep producing more. That's why we need these technologies. We don't need these technologies. They're ruining our society. They're ruining our environment. I don't know whether the Green New Deal will pass or not. But I think it is a tremendous opportunity for us to come together to build a strong, multiracial, working class movement which would demand the things which should be in the Green New Deal. Whether they get in there or not, I don't know. It depends on the strength of the movement. Well, I've gone over parity, but I, I just think that in the food movement, you know, I spoke at, the, um, at NOFA, the Northeast Organic Farmers Association, and I was going on and on about parity, and I thought, ah, oh, that's a great talk. And I got off and I started talking to some of the farmers and they said, what's parity? These are all, these are all like young, white, organic farmers. They said, what's parity? Oh my God, I really messed up. I, I assumed too much. But parity is at the core of it. The inputs which you pay for have to be covered by the prices you get for your product, enough so that you can make a dignified living. That's parity. And we can do it. We've done it in the past. But for that, we need farm justice. And farm justice has to be about equity, in dignified farm livelihoods, about parity and supply management. We have to internalize the externalities, which means that if you pollute, you pay. The costs of pollution have to be internalized into production all along the food value chain. And we need to reinvest in the countryside. The countryside's got to be a good place to live, not just for rich people. Schools, roads, health facilities. We need to invest in what's called the social wage. Don't expect the farmer to pay for everything on the basis of what they get for their crops. 
If agriculture is important to us, if food is important to us, then we have to invest in it as a society. We don't need more people in the city. We need to repopulate our countryside. But we're not going to repopulate it until it's a good place to live, until young people see it as a future, which means that as a society, we have to invest. So that's the essence of land justice. And I'm going to end with this very complicated uh, graphic here, which no one can read. So we talked about the corporate food regime. And I've been talking about the food movements. Now, each of these have two tendencies, or two currents. So the corporate food regime has a neoliberal tendency and a reformist tendency. You think about the reformist tendency, think, um, oh, you you just look at the uh, the Secretary of Agriculture, Agriculture in the last administration. They were somewhat reformist. Um, Think about the neoliberal tendency, we'll just think about it now. (laughs) Um, The reformists in this country are not terribly strong. They're fairly weak politically. Uh, The neoliberals who believe in free market everything, privatization of everything, they're very strong. So the reformists don't have the power to be able to change anything, to introduce any reforms. Those of us who voted for President Obama thought that he was going to introduce reforms. He was unable to introduce those reforms. Why? Because we didn't have a strong enough counter movement to create the political will. Roosevelt had a counter movement that was strong. He could introduce reforms. Barack Obama did not. I think that the counter-movement in the United States, you know, it's very broad, all kinds of workers. But within the food movement, I see the food movement as a counter-movement. And I see it as one of the prominent expressions of a counter-movement to liberalism or neoliberalism. But the food movement has two, two tendencies as well. One is what I call the progressive tendency, and that's most of us. These are the ones solving the problems. They're like, well, how do we get food into the community? Can we start a farmer's market? Can we have urban gardens? Uh, Can we have a farm to school program? Just solving the very immediate problems. Hmm? It's important work. It's essential work. And it's also proof of concept. Yes, it can be done. Look, we're doing it here. It's just not normalized. It's just not generalized. We're just doing it on a small scale. How do we scale up? How do we scale out? Well, to do that, you have to change the rules. You have to change the policies. You have to change the institutions. And for that, we have the radical trend. And the radical, if the, if the uh, progressives are about food justice, the radical trend is about food sovereignty, which means taking control over the food system, not just being concerned with distribution, be con- concerned with the political control in the food system. So they're talking about land reform. Or talking about the last, the stopping land loss Savvy Hornis here has been working for years on stopping black land loss with Land Loss Prevention Project. I consider that to be a radical thing to do because you're running against the tendency of the concentration of land. This country needs land reform. We can't expect to have a just and equitable food system if we don't distribute the resources equitably, and just expect all the equity to somehow take place magically in the market. It will not. So we have to build, I believe, a powerful alliance between the progressives and the radicals. Because the radicals want to change the rules and the progressives are trying to get stuff done. We need both of them. Because if we don't, what happens and what has been happening is that the reformists who are weak are going to pull those progressives over. Here, let us give you some money. Here, work with us. Here, let's do this, let's do that. But you see, when you do that, you split the counter movement down the middle. And we know that reformists do not introduce reforms unless there's a powerful counter movement. We've already had the crashes. Why didn't we get reforms? 
because we don't have a powerful counter movement. So I think that the challenge is to build alliances between progressives and radicals. This is going to be very difficult for the radicals. They don't like to work with anybody. Not you, Seb. But it does mean that we do have to come together. We do have to come together at the table. But there are things dividing us. And we have to address those things which divide us. Otherwise, we can't come together. We can't build a powerful alliance. We can't be a powerful counter-movement. And what are those things that divide us? They're historical. We know what they are. It's sexism, racism, classism. That's what divides us. So that means that the work, the agrarian work, and this is why I am so honored to be here with you, because I think you recognize this. I know you recognize this. The work of agrarian change starts with dismantling racism. It's not extra work. Dismantling racism and sexism is not extra work. It is the work. Because if we don't do that, we can't do anything else. So we have to dismantle it in our food system. We have to dismantle it in our food movement. We have to dismantle it in our organizations. And speaking of the white man of Latino heritage, we have to dismantle it within ourselves. And there are very few places where this is actually happening. The tools are there. People do know how to do this. They've been working on it. We have to deal with historical trauma. We have to dismantle white privilege, white male privilege, me. I think you're doing that. Thank you very much for your work. <laughs>